So the meeting is now being recorded. Great. Hi, everybody. So um, we will start with reviewing the minutes and also identifying the minute taker. Um, who was last? Darcy, right? Uh, Darcy was the last, um, yes. Minute taker. Okay. Yes. Um, so then, Sarah, I think that means you're the next to go. That's okay with you today. Or it has to be, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, you could build, you could put somebody else. But. Can I abstain? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so. okay, great. So then let's go ahead and review the minutes from last time. Is Darcy here? Is Darcy coming? No, Darcy, no, our son is getting married this week. And so he, she's not available. I think it's being held at her house too. So they could all come. <laughs> well, I hope they have weather like today. Does anybody, um, when they're ready, want to uh, motion to approve the minutes or have any questions or comments? I'll move to approve. I'll provide a second. Okay, great. Okay. Stephanie, do you want me to do the vote or? Sure, um, sure. I, well, I can do the vote, sorry. Okay. Um, so, Drucker? Yes. Rose? Yes. Roof? Abstain. Uh, Bregger? Yes. Selman? Yes. Durr? Yes. All right. All right, great. Um, you want me to, let me see if I can get the um, agenda up for you. Okay, can you see that? No, I can just see your folder. Okay, I never understand why it does that. Okay, we'll try again, sorry. That's okay. I think next up is public comment. Are there any public attendees? Oh, there, that worked, Stephanie. Okay, good. Uh, we don't have any public in attendance. 
Okay, and then staff updates. Sure. Um, so the the one grant funding opportunity that I think that's coming up that I mentioned to you all was the BRIC grant, the federal grant, uh, which really focuses on um, resiliency in infrastructure. And I had mentioned something at one point about dam safety, and then I said we sort of switched gears and are maybe looking um, to do solar siting. And I spoke with Andra the other day, and I think, um, and Jim Newman, and I think what we're going to try to do is to um, put something forward for townwide solar siting. So we're going to ask um, niche engineering to maybe help draft something that sort of starts the process. It wouldn't be like a full blown report because frankly, we just don't have the kind of funding for that. Um, but to do something that would sort of move us in the direction of having material to apply for the grant. So I'm going to follow up with Jim. Um, Jim, I'm going to follow up with you <laughs> after this meeting, maybe tomorrow, if you've got a moment um, when we check in actually uh, to speak about this specifically. So um, there are two other projects that the town is proposing. One is a stormwater project. One is a bridge project. So this isn't the only one. I don't know if the town, at this point, I'm not clear if the town is intending to put all three forward or we're just trying to sort of go through and see which seems like the most well-rounded proposal. Um, I haven't reached out to Northampton and Pelham, but I was hoping that maybe there might be a way that we could get them involved to look at regional solar siting as part of the CCA effort. And that might make the application a little more interesting, especially if we pair it with battery storage. So um, that that's just a sort of update on some of what I'm working on at the moment. And I've got a lot of reporting, everything. I have just a lot of reporting to do right now to different agencies. That sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. Not the reporting part, but no, the, <laughs> the reporting part is not. <laughs> but the grant part is, is exciting. It's a lot though. So we'll have to see. I mean, I'm just, I'm not, again, I'm not clear what the town town's thinking is right now in terms of if they're trying to prioritize out of the three projects. Um, so it's, you know, not necessarily means we're actually going forward with this one. So I'm not clear yet and I'll hopefully know sooner than later, certainly by the next meeting, I would know. Great. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so Dwayne, I remember that you had some kind of um, solar site study that, that a student did. Am I right? Um, that was a while ago. Um, <laughs> um, that being said, I was going to offer after uh, Andra went, which I think might be more helpful, uh, just something for you to um, look at as sort of an example, maybe it's not an exact example, uh, Stephanie, but um, we do have for, for the NREL, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab grant that we have that you're involved with um, and some others maybe, um, their draft report, but we do have these uh, solar um, uh, solar assessment report, solar siting assessment report for our three towns, uh, pilot towns uh, that could serve as a, um, uh, an example, I guess, mm -hmm. um, for you. Um, they're drafts, so I don't want them sort of distributed, but um, you might be um, uh, happy to send them to you, or they might be on the NREL box that we have. I think you're part of that. <laughs> I am, and I yeah. haven't, yeah, I haven't been able okay. to attend more recently because um, yeah. we were sort of, I was only peripherally involved in that. Um, but yeah, we can follow up, Dwayne, because I definitely wanted to sort of check in with you about that and um, ways we could maybe use some of that information to bolster the exactly. application. And, and to, to Andra's point also, I think, um, I do recall we did have a student, um, we had several, you know, projects that uh, just students interested that are working in the, G, the GIS course, they're always looking for projects. And I think we had a student take, take a project on for us on solar siting in Amherst. Um, so let me um, dig back in and see if there's anything that's came out of that that would be okay. um, worth sharing. Great. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. 
And I haven't looked into solar sighting work in the past, but does um, does it typically, or is there a way for it to include some sort of um, you know, like environmental justice element? And I'm thinking about it because I was listening into a talk today about a proposed uh, substation sighting in Chelsea and and it just made me think like, how are we gonna equitably move forward with energy sighting projects? Um, is it sort of taking, look at the region or the town and figuring out, you know, where things have been cited before, making sure we're citing other things in the places they haven't been cited. Like, I don't know, I'm just wondering if there's a best practice there for how that's being done equitably moving forward. Um, and if that's something we can incorporate. I can't speak for the past. Um, and I don't know, Duane, I thought there was sort of a piece of that in the work that you all were doing. I seem to recall for the NREL yeah, project. Two aspects to that um, on sort of both sides maybe. One is uh, there's a lot of interest in, in solar equity to cite um, solar um, equitably uh, where people want it on roofs and so forth um, uh, so that um, low income and, and, and others can have access to the benefits of solar on their own roofs um, behind the meter if you will. Um, uh, so there's there's that aspect where you actually want to find mechanisms to get solar um, ex access uh, for uh, lower income, middle income, uh, other other uh, equity dimensions, I guess. Um, um, and um, uh, but then there, there's also more the, the I think what you were getting at, Laura. Also, you don't want to necessarily um, um, cite larger scale um, solar projects in areas that unduly burden um, uh, one uh, don't don't abide by sort of sense of uh, environmental justice um, uh, and so that that's an issue as well um, and um, I don't know I mean there there it's also you know the one thing we're working with with on this NREL uh, project is um, you know, to the extent to the extent to which um, third-party developers come in and and um, site systems and reap all the the large majority of the benefits, that doesn't really um, provide too much e um, economic or or um, or environmental justice to the community, and you would tend to have a fair amount of um, pushback on on siting solar in your in your midst, but. If solar siting and solar development can be done with a um, with really community based, so that the community is invested, literally, uh, economically in, into the project, um, and um, and that they can benefit directly either through the CCA uh, or through power purchase agreements, uh, net metering, and so forth, then and, um, and and through the rates of return of owning owning these projects, um, then. Um, um, I think uh, the, the, the sense is that um, solar siting will be, um, there'll be more interest in potentially hosting solar within communities. And my hope is that we're not just sort of looking at rooftops, that we're also looking at parking lots. And I feel like there's plenty of parking lots around town. So I'm hoping that we're looking at that. And I, I don't know about, of any brownfields off the top of my head in Amherst, but you know, sort of not, not the usual, not just for one thing, not just agricultural fields, um, or if they are cited in agricultural fields, ways in which there'll be sort of a dual use um, in those locations so that they actually benefit the agricultural operation as well. And I know there have been some um, projects where that's been the case, where they've actually, you know, actually worked with um, farmers have worked with solar development to actually do something that is consistent with what they're doing agriculturally. Yeah, and the and the uh, smart program has a substantial adder for that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we actually review applications that come in 
for that dual use with our agricultural colleagues in, in uh, extension. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few of those um, being being uh, proposed. Uh, not not um, uh, any maybe uh, constructed yet, but that's just because of the pipeline of uh, development pipeline. So that's all I have. Okay, great. Um, any ECAC member updates? I have one thing to, to raise, um, which is about, um, so I learned about this through some of the investors that I work with in my, in my role at series, but, um, others may know of it from other, other ways. I'm sure Andre, you probably are, are well aware, but, um, there's the attorney general of Massachusetts has filed a petition to the D P U, um, asking them to come forward to, open an investigation, I'm gonna read it from here, open an investigation into potential changes to natural gas distribution operations to support the Commonwealth's legislatively mandated greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, and so, so the investors were actually writing a note to say that as people that are invested in things in Massachusetts, they want this to go through and they want to see them come up with a path forward. And it got me thinking about sort of the topic that we've discussed in the past around, you know, there's things that we need to do in Amherst and that we can do. And then there's a lot of things that need to happen at the state and national level. And what role does our committee have or can have in making sure that's clear. So like, what role could we have as a committee or could we ask the town to have um, as a committee of the town to like support this petition and to support other things like this where there's, um, you know, movement at the state level and a legislative level to help address things that will uh, be imperative to us meeting our goals. Yes. Uh -huh. um, I'm so glad you brought that up. I actually was about to say something um, that, that, that was related. Um, I, I think that we should consider one of our roles being, you know, writing letters for the council perhaps to, to sign or um, suggest that they you know, vote in favor of certain legislation, that kind of thing, um, <clears throat> to at least, you know, get something um, to their attention, or perhaps we could write letters ourselves um, if we had the town manager's blessing. That, that would be a good thing to find out what, the, you know, what would be appropriate. And, and I, I'd be very happy to kind of give the committee some ideas of, of things that are happening as, as they happen. Yeah, I think that's my, my fundamental question is what, what is appropriate and maybe not not to say that what has been appropriate in the past doesn't mean we shouldn't come up with something new because we have to do what we need to do. But, you know, what is the, you know, could we, can we draft, can Amherst as a town, because we have these goals that we've agreed on, do, do we have some obligation or ability to then reach out to the state level and say, hey, you know, we support this work because it supports our town's climate action goals. Like, I just don't know what the precedent is for that. Um, I, yeah, Stephanie. I think I was gonna say, I, I think you absolutely, because you're the body that's been tasked with doing this work. So I think um, you're, you know, certainly if there's anything that might be controversial that you're unsure of, um, you know, you as chair or in the future, whomever is chair can always reach out to the time manager just to inquire uh, whether or not it would be okay 
you know, if that's appropriate, but then I would just say, you know, always drafting a position, you can always draft a position, take a position and, and forward it on to the town manager and the council. Um, and, you know, maybe you can either draft it on behalf of yourselves, making the recommendation, or you can draft it for the council, you know, and then they can vote whether they want to move forward with it. But I, I think you're always, as a committee, can take a position on something that you're specifically working on, um, especially when it's regarding um, state policies and procedures. I think you always have a right to, to uh, weigh in on those things. I like Andra's notion that the town council send it. I think that's, as elected officials, I think that's um, that's got some some weight behind it. Well, then it becomes an official piece of legislation or resolution, you know, which I think is going to be one of the ways that the state will move forward. Um, so I was going to mention um, one thing that has come up in the uh, community choice segregation uh, conversations. And, and that's a way that it, it looks like the DPU is um, not being very welcoming of greenhouse gas reductions or creative approaches. Um, and so I'm thinking we might need to uh, have that law rewritten so that it's required that CCA is for greenhouse gas reductions rather than the other way around having to prove your good intentions and dot your I's and cross your T's, which is what they're doing right now to Boston. Okay, yeah, I think this is a place where we could start to take some action. Um, and I think this will be an important piece to include in the climate action plan that this is, we haven't talked about it much um, since we've started the, the task groups, but I think this was always an overarching thought of our, of our committee that, you know, you know, we're not going to be able to go out and do it on, on our own. Um, you know, I think we could, you could, we could start with this particular um, example and, and just say that, you know, write something for the council to say as, as a town that has set a greenhouse gas goal um, for net zero emissions by 2050, you know, we support the attorney general's uh, asking of DPU, or we could even just say we, we need to make sure that, you know, DPU is, to, to Andre's point, not being unwelcoming to GHG reductions or whatever we want to say, but I think we could start to to move to move in that direction um, sooner rather than later, if folks agree. Okay, great. What about? Um, I I agree with that. Um, I think that it would be more effective if we had specific elements in, in our. Amherst Climate Action Plan that needed support from the legislature and focusing on our, our attention on those, uh, those statewide initiatives, the ones that directly impact Amherst. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Steve. And I think like, you know, recognizing things like, even in the transportation work, you know, we're not gonna, as a town, we're not gonna be able to fully fund our own public transportation system. Like that has to be state level and even federal level support and recognition of the importance of public transportation, not only for an equitable society, but also for a society that's relying less on single use vehicles. Um, so I think highlighting those in the report will be really important. Uh, 
Andra, you were going to say something. Uh, yeah, I um, I was wondering also about writing letters to the editor. Um, to make our opinions known. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, of course, anybody is always welcome to do that. But I think particularly if there's if there's issues for which um, you know, more voices are better. I think we could put out calls through letters to editors to, to let other members of the community know, Hey, you can submit a comment to this for, for this, or, you know, things like that. Nice. And, and to pile on Steve's notion, I think the, the, the consistency of messaging if if we're writing a letter to the town council that we want them to move to the state that's connecting to our climate action plan we're also got a letter to the editor that describes that exact same topic and so for each there's a layered approach for each um, statement that we're making it's pretty easy to imagine relevant um state level actions. This um, move by the Attorney General is, you know, the only way that um, everyone will be able to afford to get off gas is if the gas companies transition to geothermal or, um, you know, get into the business of installing electric heat pumps and um that that's that's the only affordable way to retrofit all of our buildings yeah and i and in some of the language in this particular document and i can send you all this this article that that i'm looking at um you know is talking about how is the dpu gonna make sure that low-income customers rates remain affordable as their own revenues shrink because they have a shrinking customer base, right? Like, I mean, I think there's some real practical things that need to be, need to be thought out as we're, you know, really, we have to transition away from gas. So like, what's the plan? <laughs> Okay, so I think that's something I, I think we can sort of keep this as, as, a, as an action item. Um, and maybe we can start or Andre, if you had some ideas of other other things that we should be putting forward to the town council. Um, we can start to work on those. Another um update is uh, that I haven't finished writing our comments to the um, council committee CRC community resources committee um, about the next um, zoning you know overhaul mm -hmm. um, but it it is going slowly so um, I will and uh, is that something oh, I, I was going to get people's input by through Stephanie? Um, is it something that you want to come back to the committee and vote on? Or once everyone's had input, just send it under your name, Laura? Yeah, I think we were going to make sure everybody had a chance to look at it. Um, so potentially, if you could send it through Stephanie. Um, Maybe we can just uh, include yes. it on the agenda item for next time. Yeah, um, yeah. We might I was going to say what you would yeah. want to do is have me collect all of the comments and right. and then distribute it to everybody, and you can all yeah. decide at a meeting. You'd want to do it. You have to do it in public process anyway okay. um, to make a decision about because that would be something you'd all want to vote on. Okay. Okay. So. 
Okay, so we'll note that for the next meeting. Okay. Okay, any other ECAC updates? I, I have a colleague who's reached out um, to see if maybe she might get some FaceTime with this group um, at one of our upcoming meetings about um, this, the school buildings um, and potential collaboration and action there. I, do, you, do we have a sense of what the best way to incorporate um, that kind of thing? Like the new school buildings? I think just, no, just the idea of what's happening, you know, with all the existing and new, um, you know, how, how are we, you know, so this is, I think it's a general question. We don't, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Maybe I can ask Stephanie offline, but how, when people reach out to us and, and express an interest of like engaging our process. And I think it's, you know, my response was, so I think, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I think your colleague um, reached out to me as well. Um, and I thought it was more just attending the meeting, not specifically wanting to speak to the meeting, which is why I gave just general information. But so there's two ways that people can do so. That's to sort of just attend and speak during the public comment periods. Um, unless it's a very specific agenda item that you all want to get into a more um, involved conversation, then they can make the request to me. It goes through Laura because Laura ultimately is the one who sort of um, creates the agenda for the meetings. So Great. those are two ways, two pathways. Okay. I'll follow up. Thanks. Sure. Okay, great. So next agenda item is discussion of CAP framework goals. So I had put something together for this conversation, but I, I wasn't sure um, if there was a larger conversation that the committee wanted to have around this. Um, so Laura, I want to defer to you as far as what the vision was for the, the full conversation before I jump in. I actually think this might have been a agenda item suggestion from Jesse. Am I remembering that incorrectly? Yeah, I think that was, I, th I think I emailed you at the end of the last meeting. It seemed to me, and, and I looked at the presentation that you put together, the slides, and I think I said, I actually would lo love to hear from Lauren and Jim about as we start to pull all the ideas together, at what point is there kind of like an outline where we, or like where, when do the buckets show up that we start throwing things into? Um, and maybe just to talk about that process so we can kind of wrap our heads around it. It's, it's, it's to me at least, it's a slightly opaque right now. I trust the process, but I, I'm not sure where it's going. No, this is a great question, Jesse. Um, so I can speak to that a little bit and Jim jump in if there's anything I'm missing or anything you wanna add. Um, the way that we're thinking about it right now is that when the task groups conclude, that's when we're gonna have a clear picture of what's come out of those and we know there are gonna be gaps. And so we're gonna be trying to fill those gaps with actions and strategies and, and things that we know are important to the town but that have not come up in those discussions. And then to go back to both the participants in the task groups and city staff and you all to get feedback on how we filled those gaps, whether they are adequately filled and how they might, um, how we might make them even more robust, make the strategies that are coming out more robust. So probably by the time we are 
wrapping up with the task groups and starting to fill in those gaps, that's when we're gonna have a pretty clear idea of what those buckets are, um, or we're gonna start developing those buckets. And that's when we're gonna be filling in the gaps to make sure that those buckets are full. Um, does, that, does that help, Jim, anything you wanna add? The only thing I'd say is that the material coming out of the task groups is um, has an impressive amount of sort of ideas and strategies that are pretty well thought out and, and kind of discussed uh, m m more than I had really realized uh, when we started to really look at the material and uh, and so uh, I think that process is not gonna be, it's not like, oh, we talked about a couple of things and then we're gonna really you know, build out through it. It's like, no, I actually covered a lot of territory. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, it, it is better than I had really expected. I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to look at the notes that have come out of the task group meetings yet, but um, I think that was a very helpful process for me in, in pulling out what some of those actions are likely to look like. So can I say something here? Um, to me, you know, group conversations can riff off of some idea someone threw out. And um, what we want to, uh, I, I think it's to really start with, you know, what we know or the basics and um, take those ideas that align with those basic ones, um, look at those that nothing was discussed, you know, those gaps um, and then consider, but not necessarily put into the bucket, things that came up in the um, task groups. But I, I think it has to start with those of us who like have already been thinking about this. In terms of an outline or, you know. Outline is, the, is, the, outline the is the word I've think I, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time proceeding in this process without an outline. And that's what I was taught in third grade on how to write an essay. And it's old school maybe, but I'm, I, if we are, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like our, this group has been tasked with overseeing this process and managing it to some degree. And, 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 and if we don't see where it's going, and the information comes back to us, it seems to me like it's too late. Like I want the conceptual design before the construction drawings. And, and maybe that's already happening and in the works, but I, I guess I just don't see it happening. I will say, and then Stephanie, I'll, I'll turn to you. So it feels like five years ago, but like in February, <laughs> we, our group did develop an outline. <laughs> So we spent like most of our first few meetings this year working on the outline before Linnaean became part of our process and COVID happened. Um, so that's out there somewhere. And that was the basis for which Jim and Lauren and team like built the task groups. And um, we haven't looked at, or at it or talked about it for a while. So I think Jesse, your point's well taken that it's that as we're moving into this third task group meeting as we're starting to think through the next step of actually drafting a draft report, like we need to go back to that and see what, um, cause there's pieces of that that we've definitely covered in the task groups. And there's pieces of that that we've expanded on through some of this really rich work we've done. There's also pieces of that that weren't really applicable to the task groups. Like a big piece we wanted to make sure we included was like staffing at the town level. Like that's not something we talked about at the task group, but that's something we all want to have be a piece of our plan. Um, 
Yeah, Stephanie, did you want to add yeah. in? I had a few things. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say that um, I think what, you know, what I heard from Lauren um, and the way I've understood this process all along has been that at the end of the task group work, because a lot of information will be formulated there um, from pretty much constituencies that typically aren't at the table and which is why we did this process in this way, right? This was something that we're doing differently. Um, and so they weren't, some of the things that were coming from that process weren't going to necessarily be reflected in some of what you've already discussed or they had been, but maybe not to as much of a degree. Um, and then that the outline was going to come. So the outline is coming. I think it's just the outline is coming. And then when that outline exists in front of you, that's when you can also look at the outline that the group had done before to say, okay, where are there gaps in this outline with maybe the outline that you had previously created that we can fill in. I think that's really, I'm just sort of reiterating what Lauren said. Um, because sometimes maybe hearing it twice is helpful. I don't know, but, but um, it's just that, the, you know, the times. outline, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, there's going to be, I mean, you had an outline. This is like another outline that's being created based on this process. So I don't know if that's helpful. Um, and then that information that you had that isn't reflected in the outline that gets created from the task group meetings, that's where we're talking about filling in, you know, the gaps with that information to make sure that it's a co more comprehensive um, document that reflects both what you've already started working on and identified as wanting to work on, but also additionally with some community input on some priorities that maybe you didn't have identified so much at the beginning. Again, I keep going back to communication, but that seems to consistently come up. So um, again, not specifically identified in earlier um, framing, but really important in moving forward. Thanks, Tiffany. I, yeah, failed to mention the previous outline, so I think that was probably a helpful reminder for everyone. I see the, um, I was reading the Somerville Carbon Plan that Lauren, you sent out earlier today, I believe, and it's like, wow, why don't we do that for Amherst? I think that would be, that's what I'm hoping we can do, which would be a greenhouse uh, gas inventory analysis and then identifying um, pathways and then identif identifying implementation plans. That, that seems to have the perfect framework and the outline for us. And then all this outreach that we've been doing that will provide some additional ideas and has provided principles on which um, sort of how we prioritize or make decisions. I just want to add to that, Steve, that um, that's part of the reason I think we were doing the work in the way that we were doing it too, is because when these plans get developed and created, um, in order to implement, sometimes people aren't at the table when these conversations are happening, so that implementation suddenly becomes um, something that people feel that is basically um, imposed on them in some way. Whereas this process is giving people an opportunity to have more of a voice and to get more involved and also to have some buy-in and to be more invested in what this is all about and understanding it. Um, and I think that's what's something that's been really valuable is that, you know, we basically are working with people to sort of create ambassadors, if you will, of this information so that as we move forward, we have people who can really get behind it and sort of communicate it within you know, um, their neighborhoods, their complexes, their, you know, their layers of influence, if you will. So Steve, I, I wanted to um, address the issue of the pathway study. I'm glad you brought that up and I'm glad that you had a chance to look through those slides. I'm not sure that everyone did. Um, I see Andra shaking her head no. So um, maybe it would be helpful for me to go through them quickly. I see some thumbs up. All right. So let me just share my screen. 
Here we go. Can everyone see that? Yep. Great, thanks. So, um, sorry, I'm just having some issues here with Zoom. Okay, there we go. So there was a question at, out of the last meeting about how um, the plan will address carbon measurement. And I wanted to respond directly to that. But before we jump in, I just wanted to create a little bit of context around Amherst's current trajectory. So moving on to the next slide. This slide just shows um, the chart on the right is actually taken from the town's most recent greenhouse gas emissions inventory, um, breaking down emissions by subsector. And so you'll see all the different categories included. The colleges and university make up almost 50% of the town's emissions. Um, and they've also made these really ambitious climate commitments as I'm sure Steve, Dwayne, um, Ashwin, he's not here, but also, and Laura formerly um, can attest to you. Um, and they're working really diligently towards achieving them. So UMass has, UMass and Amherst College have both pledged to become carbon neutral by 2030. And Hampshire College has pledged to become climate neutral in the next two years. Um, so what this means, going on to the next slide, is that if the colleges meet their goals, then the town is going to meet its goals handily. But obviously the ECAC um, wants to be way more ambitious than that. Um, and we're taking action to reduce emissions even further to prepare for carbon neutrality by 2030. So to really quantify that trajectory, that's why I put in this pathways slide and why I sent along that study. Um, a more in-depth analysis than what's possible within the current framework of the CAARP will be necessary. So this graph shows the summary of the city of Somerville's carbon neutrality pathway, carbon neutrality pathways study, which analyzed actions across all their emissions sectors using some pretty complex modeling and projections to evaluate their emissions reductions potentials over time. And they started with business as usual projections, which Amherst has from their last greenhouse gas inventory which reflect the assumption that no new actions are taken beyond what is already being done. And then break down the relative contributions of different emissions reduction pathways on the way to carbon neutrality by 2050. So carbon neutrality pathway studies are highly individualized analyses. And as I'm sure many of you know, um, they take into consideration the unique emission sources and potentials of the location under study. And they're typically done in conjunction with an update to a greenhouse gas inventory, which is something on the immediate horizon for Amherst, given that the last greenhouse gas inventory was conducted in 2017 using data from fiscal year 2016. So next year, we will have the data from fiscal year 2021, which is, we're actually in fiscal year 2021 right now. Um, so that will have been five years since the last emissions inventory was conducted. So rather than abbreviating the current planning process to meet the town's budget request timeline, which we've talked a little bit about, um, we want to recommend to the committee that you consider putting forward a budget request that includes funds for an updated carbon uh, greenhouse gas emissions inventory and an accompanying pathway study that can go really in depth into what these different trajectories over time might look like. So what we will be able to do with the Climate Action Adaptation and Resiliency Plan is to use widely available information about the relative impacts of different types of actions on carbon emissions in other similar contexts to provide an indication of the relative magnitude of the carbon reductions associated with different types of actions, similar to how, for instance, Concord's plan lays that out. Um, and I know Concord's plan is one that this committee has referenced extensively. So, um, I can actually just wanted to pull up a page from it to show you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, so give me one second here. And I'm almost done, I promise. So here is 
just a page from the buildings and energy section of, of Concord's plan. And you can see that the way that they've done this is that their actions are coded according to whether they contribute very positively or positively to greenhouse gas emissions reductions or neutral. This is the buildings and energy category. So most of them do have some greenhouse gas emissions reduction relationship. Um, some of them are just neutral with respect to, to emissions in other categories and that's indicated as well. Then for some specific actions, we will be able to provide an estimate for the associated emissions reduction potential. For, for instance, with the CCA, um, we can provide an estimate of how, how much greenhouse gas emissions will be reduced as a result of the CCA, assuming that a certain percentage of renewables is in the mix and the program gets a certain retention rate. We can do things like that. Um, but the sort of in-depth pathways analysis that I sent to you um, that Somerville did, that's sort of the next level above and beyond. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you, you all. And hey, Lauren, um, I just want to say something on this page, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, I really like sort of a combo of these two approaches. Um, and I would even like us to think about how we could add to this a, in addition to GHG reductions and resiliency, like a framework around environmental justice or equality or like a just transition, thriving economy, whatever terminology we want to use. Um, and we won't be able to check it for all of them, but I think it would go a long way to make sure we're thinking about the impact all of these actions have in that space. Absolutely. That's a great thought, Laura. I feel like it, it also relates to the, the previous conversation around sort of how to integrate advocacy and policy into the plan and sort of, I, I think we're really talking about the larger framework of the plan here and definitely having those types of equity and, and justice analyses built into how we're thinking about actions is, is considered a best practice in the field right now. So definitely great thing to be thinking about. The uh, Anchorage plan, 2019 Anchorage plan has that. They've got co-benefits section describing those benefits yep. and then in the sections that look like the one that Lauren has showed up in addition to columns for greenhouse gas reduction and resilience there are other columns that might be equity or might be environmental or other um, where's the list of them here uh, uh, other um, advanced equality local environmental quality improve health so they do evaluate their potential initiatives on the four additional things besides greenhouse gas reductions. The other dimension that might be worth um, um, qualifying, not quantifying, but qualifying mm -hmm. in this sort of way is um, ease of, ease of, ease of um, getting it done. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, things that are, get good greenhouse gas reductions and are e easy, to easy to get done, let's go for those you know, straight up, uh, others are, are um, might have, um, you know, little reductions and hard to do, so might cast those aside a little bit. Um, uh, so that might be another dimension to, to bring into this. Yeah, Jesse. So the, the I think the, the pathways analysis is very compelling, the way, the, the graphics of it, you know, and I, I it, is it reasonable, uh, without the in-depth modeling and without the analysis to give order of magnitude um, predictions based on, you know, large primary strategies, you know, the ability to look at a single image and say, okay, here are the 10 big things we have to do and this one's gonna do between this and that. I just think the story being told here, you know, can we tell that story without the number, basically have the numbers be accurate, but not necessarily precise. Uh, there's an interesting thought here uh, where, um, uh, yeah, I, this, is, this is kind of a, a cheap answer, but, uh, but it's a good answer nonetheless. Uh, and that, um, that is that actually the committee itself has a ton of uh, relevant knowledge on these topics, and uh, it may be that there's a you know a series of meetings with the ECAC 
to quantify a series of things uh, because of the specific knowledge that you bring to this process. Uh, and um, I think that there's a real opportunity there. Um, you know, that's one of the fantastic things about the ECAC is that it really, you know, it, it, as a committee, it's loaded with people with tons and tons of knowledge on these topics. I think some of those answers, Jesse, can come out of the analysis of the Amherst Greenhouse gas inventory. And then we might be able to say, let's reduce building energy by 15%. We kind of make up a target and then we try it. We see how much we accomplish in the year and then we readjust the target and the strategy, implementation strategies as necessary. I don't think we need to get too hung up on trying to predict what the outcomes will be. I think we're better off um, implementing the initiatives um, rather than trying to predict them. Yeah. And that's a great point, Steve, that, that how things get quantified or thought about is going to depend on the specific goals that the ECAC sets that then get codified in the plan. Yeah, Andra, did you have something to add? Well, I'm remembering back to a conversation, maybe several, with Stephanie um, over the years about how um, hard it is to get really accurate greenhouse gas uh, measurements that it's a lot of guesswork anyway and so um, the idea of getting ballpark uh, accuracy level um, but reasonably you know derived estimates makes sense to me um, because there's so many assumptions you put in to predictions and, and even measurements of current greenhouse gas reductions that, and, or, or emissions that, um, I, I, yeah, I, I like to keep that idea of, you know, not spending too much money getting too accurate. Well, it's a, yeah. Accurate, stay accurate, just not too precise. I mean, and this has been my experience through the years is my one page spreadsheet and the 20 page passive house spreadsheet tend to end up with about the same number. And then there's some people that just like, yeah, that's the number. Mm -hmm. And, and then don't, don't even turn their computer on. Um, I, I, that, that I would really, be Henry Gifford. <laughs> yeah, there's the Henry Giffords that, you know, of the world. Um, so I, I want to, yeah, I like this idea. And, but you need certain language. Once you start giving images and numbers that sh say, this is what we can do. And this is how much it's going to cost. And this is how hard or easy it is. You need something to back it up with. But, you know, I... I you need, I'm sorry, Jesse, to jump in, but you know, it's, you need the accuracy as you stated, but you need consistency. You just have to be doing it in the, in the same way consistently in order to have anything that's a meaningful measure. So what I was saying before was that, you know, we have these numbers and so to a degree, you know, there is, there's, there is close as we can get to the information that we have available. Right. Um, but we can't then you know, in the next inventory, unless we go back and sort of change how we gathered some of that information, we can't come back with a new inventory and do it completely differently and then look at the two and compare the two. I mean, we either have to go back and change what we did or we have to create a whole new inventory and a way to start. So that's why I was saying it's, you know, it's about the consistency and how we do it. Yeah, I would just also offer, and I'm one to go with the 20 page spreadsheet, but I'm, I'm good with the single, the, the one sheet as well. But um, uh, and, and particularly for this reason, and, I, and, and let me just first say, I, I agree with Stephanie in terms of um, in for, for greenhouse gas accounting, you wanna be, you wanna be um, accurate, but also consistent over time. So, or at least know how you've made those adjustments so you can make, make adjustments so you can, you can uh, basically uh, monitor yourself um, reasonably accurate in terms of the, the progress you're making in, during this time. But in terms of the um, pathways, um, I guess what, I'm not sure if I agree with what I'm going to say, but um, 
to some extent, I feel like we have an easy an easy case here uh, because we we're going 100 percent. So it's not like do we do this or that? We, we got to get rid of all of it. So it's not like um, we have to say, OK, well, you know, we got to do trans this and that. You know, it's like, let's just do it. You know, it, it all, all the wedges have to go down. Um, and so it's just a, it just a matter of what are the techniques and challenge and uh, technologies to do it. So I would sort of think be, um, you know, maybe what's more helpful is um, not, you know, showing a wedge that goes down to zero because we, we sort of know the, we know the end of that story that we want to show, uh, but, um, really get at um, what are the, um, the technologies and the business models and the costs and the challenges and the policy changes um, and the early actions we can take in the meantime um, that will start us off on this path. I think, I think we did say early on that while we want a report that shows how we get to 100% um, reductions by 2050 or whatever we said, um, that uh, we really also wanna focus on what do we do in the next five years? Um, and so, um, uh, to some extent, I well, I did. I, I actually like that AECOM, the the um, was it Somerville, nice report and so forth. I I, I didn't think it had too much uh, in there in terms of um, um, uh, how you get things done and costs and so forth. It was more um, technical, uh, which I think helps. But at the same time, I think any of us, not maybe most of us, could probably just had had guessed at this in this method that you know you need building energy efficiency some district heating some heat pumps some um uh, and some uh, electrification the gas and then in the transportation sector uh and then electrify uh, re uh clean energy for all the electricity um and um uh so to some extent i think um um we, we <laughs> We got we got an e easy analysis because it's all got to be scrubbed out. <laughs> yeah, and and I think um, yeah, I think Jim, you're exactly right. I think we have a lot of um, talent and expertise in this group. I think we also have several of us, myself included, who sometimes try to get too detailed, and um, so we'll have to be helped to stay uh, above the fray. But I think even just like clearly recognizing um even for our own our own group because i think sometimes we get caught up in in um topics that maybe you know we have to keep reminding ourselves that's actually a really small part of our footprint and so like how much time do we want to spend on that like it would be it would be great if our if our report could show yes we any new capital that buildings any new buildings we build in the next 20 years have to be energy efficient, you know, and fossil fuel free, whatever. But even if we do that, that's only going to be this much of our footprint because we still have all these other buildings. And so we still need to focus in on retrofits and, you know, just moving the whole system. That will be really helpful for when we get, then when we get questions or when we get pulled into conversations about library or the library or something like we can make sure we're balancing that with all of the other work that we're trying to do. And that's why this effort is town wide and why we're engaging community members because we need people in their own homes to be doing things and to take this seriously and we need to reach landlords. We need to add, you know, get people to really rally to advocate to get the landlords to do the right thing because we have several complexes because again, as was pointed out already, you know, the, the university and the colleges are 50% of the town's emissions. So on the municipal side that you have sort of a more direct influence over is so small. Um, so it's really this sort of time-wide approach where we really need to engage everybody that's different than what we've done before. Okay, just uh, uh, go ahead, Andra. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think there's some things that we can decide, like um that as the town's committee um we have members of the university and college communities but we don't have any control and so i'd like 
us to agree that we are focusing on when we say 25% reduction by 25, 50 by 2030, we're talking about what we have influence over. And that, you know, we're really glad that the university and colleges are making progress. That's icing. But our job is really the cake. I, I would agree with that from a perspective of we shouldn't be focusing our actions on the colleges and universities. I mean, I think to Stephanie's earlier point, if the colleges and universities are part of our footprint, which they are, and we'll continue to include them. And if they're doing their job, that's going to help us meet our goals. But yeah, we need to be focused in on what, you know, assuming that I we guess we could make some assumptions about where they may or may not be in five years, but I think we need to focus in on what we can do in the community. Yeah, that, that was going to be my same question, actually, was, you know, what is, and I think we talked about this early on, but I sort of forget, I mean, what is, what, what's the boundary we're drawing around the um, um, greenhouse gases for our, our purposes with regard to our goals? And I guess I, I, um, I agree with Andra that, I mean, the university and the colleges are, um, you know, they have comparable sort of committees to some extent um, working on their own plans. And I think our, our attention should really be focused on everything else. Exactly. And I want to um, first credit Lauren with that point that um, if the colleges are successful, then the town is successful. I just want to make sure that was Lauren, not me, but um, but I but I do, I agree and I hear you, but I also want to be, you know, us to be mindful of the language that the town council passed, you know, and it was pretty much community wide. It wasn't, you know, just, oh, we're committed to this piece that we have control over. It was like an agreement that community wide, the town would be carbon neutral by 2050. That's everybody. So it's just a matter, and yes, I would say don't focus so much on the pieces that you don't have control over. Um, yes, absolutely. And that's why this effort to do so much citizen outreach and, you know, um, res resident outreach is so important and also business engagement. It's just to get everybody actively engaged in this um, and to realize that every little thing that everybody does matters and contributes. But I guess I'm talking about the, um, that we ought to have a dual accounting system, community-wide, including the campuses and within the town community and and that that we should hold ourselves to um, making the kind of you know meeting our targets within the town community and not rest on the work that's happening on campus you know what I heard Lauren say is, you know, if they're successful, we're successful because we don't have to do anything. We not have to do as much. But that's obviously <laughs> not true. Run, yeah, and run, we can't. Right? Yeah, that we there we can't use the colleges to buy us time. <laughs> Wait, somebody wants to say hi. Say hi. Hey. hey. Hi. Woo. Hi. Oh, I should go grab the puppy. He's been a little <laughs> hyper. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I was going to say that, you know, to that point, I, that's, I guess what I'm saying is you are working with the part of the town that you have control over and influence over. Um, and that's not necessarily the colleges and the university. I mean, you're certainly, I think, want to work with them and collaborate with them to this goal. Um, especially if they have those existing committees, then we want to have some more maybe interface with them. You know, that's something maybe that can the, develop over, over, you know, as once this plan is done, maybe that's one of the things you want to do is like have more interface um, or have our representatives to each of those institutions liaison with them in some form or other, if you all are willing. Um, you know, and then that's a way to, you know, to sort of have a, a common purpose. But again, your, you know, your influence is over the community members, the businesses, and the municipal sector, you know, the buildings, the town buildings. Um, and 
there's plenty to do there. Um, again, and I really, I, I can't say and emphasize enough about the residential sector um, that I just think that's a really big piece that keeps getting missed because it's not something you have direct influence over and why something like CCA will be important and CCA programming, hopefully, <laughs> that is going to happen eventually will be important. Um, those are the types of things that I think, you know, the kind of thought processes that, that need to be looked to. Okay. Yeah, Lauren. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify too that by no means was I saying that with the colleges meeting their goal means that you guys don't have to do anything. I think if anything, it means that you can be more ambitious because there's more, we know that you are taking action and those actions are going to have impacts. And so we're gonna go above and beyond those goals, which is great. Yeah, and I just add, um, yeah, Andra, I think you're right. I mean, I think we should be trying to identify enough <clears throat> projects that we think are going to move us to our goal by 2025 without the colleges doing anything. I mean, I think we should do that analysis, right? Um, I don't think we should take them out of our pie for a few reasons. One being that just the fact that they're in our pie is part of the reporting requirements of doing an inventory for a community. Um, but also because what if they like stop doing what they're supposed to be doing? We would want the town to be able to use its influence to say, hey, Amherst College, you need to, the town has a goal and you're part of it and you need to do your piece. So I think we want to kind of like play be able to play both sides and um but yeah i agree we shouldn't be and i don't think that that was lauren's intention but you know i think we should be trying to identify projects that we can do now in the residential municipal um and community space that help us meet our 25 percent goal mama look at you Anybody else have any, um, this has been a really, I think, helpful conversation and bringing us back to some of the pieces of the work that we know we need to do, um, which is great. Uh, any other comments specifically on this presentation or just thoughts about this topic before we move on? I just think quickly just to, to restate the importance of the story that's being told with the images and where it's where it's very clear and where it's not. And I know that the pie chart is not didn't come from Linnaean, but for example, just the word community, like I don't think anybody knows what that means. And you have to dig into like a long explanation in the back of that spreadsheet. So just as we continue to, as this continues to evolve, like just asking what story is being told, how clear is it? And, and, and um, I, because I, I think, I think we're getting, it's, it's very, it's exciting. I was very excited by this presentation. Great. So I'm trying to just pull up my agenda here. Um, discussion on communicating goals to town regarding zoning and budget. So we talked about the zoning discussion having next next time. Um, and the capital inventory request. We did get a proposal through from Darcy um, or draft from Darcy. Laura, can I just jump in real quick about, yeah. because there's a piece about the communications that I wanted to, I did some follow up on and I just wanted to report out on that I asked um, Brianna Sunrid, who's the um, communications manager for the town to attend the next meeting because she and I were talking about dashboards, which is something that Darcy had brought up several times and, you know, I'm aware of, but just ways in which there might be something we can do, but she can sort of talk a little bit about what's been done for other committees, what we might have the capacity to do, um, some of what our constraints are 
Uh, so she'd be willing to come to the next meeting on the 7th, on October 7th, or whatever that date is, um, provided we put her at the beginning and we front load her, she'd be able to come. Yeah, that, that sounds great. And um, maybe on that, Lauren or Jim, could you let us know when the um, uh, next task group meetings are? Hmm. Yes, yeah, sorry, I thought um, <laughs> we had, uh, I did send out um, calendar holds to everyone with those meeting times, um, but just for the, the larger groups knowledge, um, we did need to spread them out a little bit more than last time this time, just because of scheduling conflicts with folks being at home with kids right now and um, yeah, dealing with those types of things. So um, they're spread out over three weeks. Um, we have the first one happening the first week of October um, on the, sorry, I was playing my calendar. The first one is happening October 8th. That's going to be the land use task group um, from 6.30 to 8.30. Then we have the following week, the transportation task group meeting that's happening Wednesday the 14th from 4 to 6 p.m. Then we have the renewables task group meeting happening on Sunday the 18th from 3 to 5 p.m and the buildings task group meeting happening Thursday the 22nd from 6 to 8 p.m. And if anybody did not get a calendar hold from me, please let me know. And also I'll be sending out the Zoom invitation um, links with those dates to everybody um, and with the meeting notes from the second meeting. So I'll be sending it all together. And that will happen by the end of this week. Okay, great, that's helpful. Yeah, so I think in terms of timing, um, I think it'd be great to have um, Rihanna come next, next week. Um, Annabelle, can you go? Um, and I'm thinking that we probably want to have maybe, um, a, like, I think on this topic of outlines and sort of the framing of the report, I think we probably need to move forward on that while we're going through the task group. I don't, I don't think we can wait until the task group trees are all done. Um, so maybe we can figure out how to add that as a, I, I guess I'd look to, to you all for, um, feedback on how to do that in a way that's not <coughs> making you overdo or redo work, but like, how can we push that forward? And if we want to start like digging into some of these questions that we were just talking about around like percent reductions and, and things, we could do that in the next couple meetings as we're waiting for that final task group feedback. So the next um, item is around the capital inventory process. And I believe Stephanie forwarded this. Uh, maybe Stephanie, you could pull it up. Yeah, I was just gonna say, let me, um, let me get it for you. So just to remind folks, this is um, a point that Darcy had had brought to us that we were requested by the finance committee to make suggestions regarding the capital inventory process. Um, and so, so Darcy's done a first stab at um, 
what information we think is important. I think what's missing here that we've talked about, which we can add is just like, in general, they, they need to do the inventory that they already have. Like we know that the inventory includes questions about operational energy use, but they don't necessarily fill that piece out. So I think we need a tactful way to maybe add that here and potentially offer up ECAC support if they have questions or want help on how they can do that. So I'm sorry, did, I'm uh, sorry, we have like chaos happening behind me. <laughs> um, so you didn't see anything right? about that, Stephanie. Uh, I, yes, I, <laughs> so I'm sorry, did you, is it not showing? It's hard for me, I can't see what you're seeing, so. It's not, I have it right here, I can pull it up. Uh, is it showing now? Oh, you got it, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hate your face now. Sorry. So I guess if we could just um, maybe look through this quickly, and if anybody, if anything's hopping out as any at anyone as being missing, um, let me know. Otherwise, I can just add that point about the life cycle costing and energy use and we can send it on. I think this looks really good. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, like on, and try to also think about it from their perspective in terms of what will they, what will they be confused about and, and unsure of how to respond to or, or provide information. So like for um, HVAC systems, um, I mean, they, they, do we really want them to give us how many with the, the greenhouse gas emissions from that? That would be, I'm not sure if they're in a situation to be yeah. able to do that. Yeah, I was going to say some of this, uh, you know, there's way more here than the town is going to be able to do. And even, even, you know, with the, um, tools and resources that I have, I don't, you know, I'd have to look to our our inventory to get some of that information. But I would like on, on either HVAC systems or maybe it's buildings is, is um, in addition to what you do have there is how much energy, how much ener their energy use, if that, if, if Stephanie thinks that's possible. I think, I mean, and again, that's something that we're more able to do if we were doing a sort of basic, you know, reporting out on, you know, kilowatt hours per, you know, per square foot or something. If we were doing something that was a more straightforward um, calculation, then we can do that. Yeah. Trying maybe to do, do emissions that. or... Yeah. Maybe what about EUI? What about just a simple EUI? And yeah, so that's, it'll all yeah. be the same units. Right, exactly. Like we could do EUI for, for, the, build, for the facilities and HVAC systems, but we can't, you know, we're not gonna be able to do just greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, I think potentially maybe we're just looking for the information we need so that we could do that calculation, right? Exactly, exactly. On the uh, buildings, I think it would be helpful to know if they're steam heated or hot water heated. Oh gosh, now I've got another one. Chaos over here. <laughs> Feeling so much better. <laughs> oh, okay. the cat. The cat. Yeah, the cat was <laughs> writing on... for you. <laughs> I am on mute. There is like a battle going on just outside my door. <laughs> <laughs> if you only could hear it right now, it's bad. Okay, um, that's helpful. Anything else? I think um, maybe Stephanie and I can go through this list and just update it to remove, I think that's a good point to me that it should be stuff that, that they can easily answer and that we could use. Um, is there anything else that that's missing? 
Um, maybe plans already in place for upgrades, replacements. You know, not, not just routine ones, but, you know, the water treatment plant is going through some changes already, right? So. Yeah, there's some, um, some buildings that we're specifically targeting um, to look at changing out the heating systems to, um, to, uh, Oh my goodness, sorry, it's, I'm tired. Um, help me <laughs> to- um, Something electric. else. Yes, to some, <laughs> something more efficient. efficient. Yes, yes, thank you. Heat <laughs> yes, heat bumps and yes. Yeah, I think that's a good, a, a good point. Um, because even like projected lifetime necessarily doesn't necessarily say that when it's they're thinking but if they're thinking that this piece is going to be replaced in the next two to five years or something like that would be helpful information to know yeah and that's the kind of thing i think that i was saying to darcy too that the town is starting to work on we've got this new person who's really great and um it started with the building commissioner and he started to try to put things together um, and create sort of a master list so i know that there's an effort underway i mean they're looking you know they're looking at sort of this the status of each um, municipal building and you know what state it's in and um, what heating systems are exist and what can be changed out and and we have funding to do some work too um, you know there's definitely been projects that were um, there was funding allocated for them that just haven't happened yet so you know we still have lots of things that we can do so this is a good this is good timing to try to get this in front of them to, to consider all this. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think we can, um, you know, I noted it here, but I'll add it to the top. Like, just make this, make it clear that we're here just to help and support and, you know, be partners in, in this work. It's, it's what I often say. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll um, sort of make these changes and, and send this through. Um, if anybody has any thoughts that come to them in the next couple days, let us know. Um, so... Let's see. I think that was everything on the agenda. We've talked about the next meeting agenda as well. Um, anything else, any last thoughts that folks have? Or we can give ourselves some time back. Okay, great. I'm gonna take that as a no. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. We will talk soon. Thanks, well Laura. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye. Bye.